Hola, buenas noches. Good evening. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications de la, Hola, with la Plaza noches. de Cultura y Artes. Here, hold on. Hold on. Hola, And I'm back. I was double talking there. Anyway, thank you for joining us on En Casa con la Plaza, brought to you by the La Plaza de Cultura y Artes and our sponsors, which include Kaiser Permanente, Aetna CVS, Union Pacific Foundation, California Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. They bring to you these sessions that we've been going that we've been broadcasting since april of 2020 so it's uh, almost two years now uh again due to the pandemic uh, our live programming has been curtailed somewhat but starting next month we begin again with outdoor programming uh a couple updates on la plaza de cultura y artes we've been open now since uh, last july and we keep our schedule of tuesday through monday closed only on Tuesday, excuse me, Wednesday through Monday, we're open and we're closed on Tuesdays with full exhibition schedule, which includes uh, our permanent exhibitions. La, en casa, uh, uh, let's see, Calle Principal, LA starts here. And then also for a limited time, only till uh, the middle of February, Carlos Amaras, Evolution of Form, which is on the second floor. And most recently, we, uh, we displayed a beautiful painting by Frank Romero going to the 1984 Olympics. And of course, our most recent exhibition, Patriotism in Conflict, Fighting for Country and Comunidad, which is uh, uh, centered around the, the Chicano Moratorium of 1970, which took place in, uh, in, the, in East LA. So I'm looking for some information here that I want to in introduce our guest. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do introduce our host, Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, who is the president of the Mexican American Cultural Educational Foundation, and he'll tell you all about it. And uh, let's bring up Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz. Please join us. Hello, hello, Abelardo. Good, good evening, friends. Good evening. What an amazing opportunity to, to celebrate uh, one of uh, our, our most uh, beloved and respected directors. And, uh, and, and I'm very, very proud to, to, to have this, this event. Um, I was going to say, can we, uh, it, can, can we see right now my, my uh, slide? That right here, this is Mexican American History Maker. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, Dr. beautiful, Chris. beautiful. Um, so, my friends, my name is Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, and I'm the president of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation. And uh, our mission is to change the, the distorted narrative uh, of Mexican Americans. And, um, you know, we, we know why we need to do it. You know, a lot of people ask me all the time, well, why only Mexican Americans? And I, it, to me, it's very important that we understand and we cannot forget. Uh, 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 the, 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 the history of our people for over 200 years, you know, we, we, the, the, the tremendous uh, abuse and, 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 and um, the very negative narrative that has been said about Mexicans. And, um, and it is a shame because it is, it is completely unfounded. You know, we, you know, we Mexican-Americans have contributed to this country in endless ways. We've been here for, for before, before America existed, Mexicans were in this land and uh, we started, we invented the cowboy uh, uh, a culture. Um, and you know what is funny is that the, the, uh, although we've been here, you know, for hundreds of years, we still seem to be the newcomer, the newcomer invaders in this country. And, and that's extremely unfair and it's, it's silly, actually, when you think about it, right? Uh, even myself, which is kind of an interesting story, even myself, who I am a, a, an immigrant, and I've been here in this country for a few decades, um, but you know that, that, that picture that you see on the right, that is actually, I, I had totally forgot about this until you know a couple of years ago that I was looking at super old photos, and I found this photo right here, 
that's my grandfather, my great grandfather, great great grandfather, in fact, who was born in Texas before the turn of the century, and and uh, and and then his son went to war, went to to he fought in the Second World War, so. Um, so my family, in fact, although I'm an immigrant, but my family actually has roots in America already for, for decades and decades. And, and all Mexicans, we do. So we're not newcomers, and it is not fair that we are seen like that. We contributed to this country in endless ways. And that's why we need an organization that reminds us of that, because our story is different. Again, why Mexican-American and not Latinos? Because our, our story is very different than a, not, a lot of other Latinos, and we need to make sure that we correct it. You know, if, 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 we're, if we're Cubans or if we're Puerto Ricans or, or Argentinians or Spaniards or, you know, Colombians, we're the cool Latinos. You know, you get a lot of opportunities. And if you're Mexican, then we are the, 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 those darn Mexicans. And that needs to change, my friend. We're tired of this. I don't know, are you tired of this? Are we tired to be always portrayed in Hollywood as, as the worst possible? You know, always look at like, the, 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 the negative things about our culture. And yeah, of course there's negative things, but there's negative things in every culture, right? Uh, the reality of who we are is we're 40 million Americans of Mexican descent with great stories, you know, that have contributed for, for hundreds of years to this country. And the story needs to change. And we are so, you know, we have so much to be proud of. You know, we, we don't come from, as sometimes people portray, that we come from this drug-infested country with no, no value. I mean, we come from a country that is the 15th largest economy of the world, a country that, that has so much culture and so much history, which, you know, which the U.S., America has benefited from. We have so much culture, so much history that we have more museums than anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, so much art. And of course, we, we the Mexican-American Culture Education Foundation, we're, we're fighting to, to give the opportunity to change this narrative. And, and we do that by, by providing scholarships, by providing grants for, film, for, for great stories to be made. Uh, we, we, uh, we invite you to participate in the Mexican American Film and Television Festival, which is going to be uh, in, in May 14 and 15. And of course, one of the, 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 the things that we are the most excited about, in that, and that is honoring Mexican American history makers. You know, we, we, one way in which we uh, celebrate our culture is, is honor our people, the people that have continued contributed to this country in so many ways. And of course, we have in the past had some outstanding people. And today we have somebody that I'm so excited to, to have the opportunity to, to, uh, to chat with, to introduce to you. And I know many of you who, if you're in the film industry, and I know many of you are gonna be seeing this uh, in, on Facebook, on our website, on the La Plaza website. And, uh, and, and you need to know Jesus Salvador Trevino. You need to know that he is one of the most uh, successful television and film directors, uh, uh, that he has a, an amazing story to tell. He's, he's received dozens of awards of all uh, sorts of organizations that have honored him because of his great achievement as a director. Uh, he, he's been an activist from from uh, from from the beginning, and uh, and and he's written a book which you know we will chat a little bit about, which is called "Eyewitness: A Filmmaker's Memoir of the Chicano Movement," which is which is an amazing document. I had the the, the, the honor of reading that book, and I can tell you, it tells a story it, it, when Jesus talks about uh, about his his experience. I, I tell you, it really, it really makes, it really makes us realize what, how, how important it is to, to, to understand the difficulties and also the advantages of being a, a Chicano Mexican American. So, without any more introduction, uh, may I please introduce to you, my friends, director, 
Jesús Salvador Treviño. Here Jesus, I am. How are you? Good evening. Yes. We Here are I gonna am. have a, the amazing opportunity to, to learn about your life and how you became this amazing director. What a what a great um, what a great opportunity. Well, thank you for hosting me, and um, I look forward to having a little conversation, and um, you know, listening to um, <clears throat> to to what people may ask and, and find out. So um, I'll, I'll I'll try to put on a good act, a, a good show here for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, my friend, you're you're a pro, so we know that that's something that that's something that you for sure can do. So, um, well. Uh, we want to know, we want to know a lot about you, Jesus, and, and, um, and I want to start by, uh, uh, you know, I, I read your book, I learned so much about your background, and just as we were saying how we Mexican-Americans have been here for a very long time, you, in fact, my friend, you represent that. You've been, your family has been in, in the U.S. since the 1700s. You know, uh, and so you, so your family has been in Texas for all for hundreds of years, in uh, the Trevinos, and um, you were born in Texas, in fact. And um, how was? What do you remember about that? What are your memories about your your life in Texas? Well, <clears throat> I was um, um, a young kid. My, my I was born in El Paso, Texas, and um, I. Um, um, lived in, in, in El Paso um, in what's called Segundo Barrio, which is the poorest neighborhood there. And um, uh, I'm told by my mother uh, that uh, when I was about two, two or three years old, they used to dress me up as a little pachuco because uh, the term pachuco or chuco comes from El Paso. And, um, but, uh, you know, the Trevinos um, have been in, in, in Southern Texas for years and years um, and um, I haven't traced all my family line down, but I do know that uh, I've, I've seen a, a headstone that has Jose Trevino and, and it was dated 1700. So I know we go back that far at least. And that was in Texas, in Southern Texas. Um, but you know, what I remember um, is that um, during, as I was growing up, I would spend the summers um, in Juarez with my grandparents and my cousins. And uh, so every summer I would go to uh, El Paso and I would spend a couple of months there. Um, I got to know the El Paso library very well because I every day I'd cross over on the bus and, and go from Juarez to El Paso, go to the library. Uh, and that's how I discovered uh, books and, and how I discovered uh, music, uh, my first blues. <laughs> And, and uh, music I learned from there. Um, so it was, uh, it was a very rich experience, uh, bilingual, bicultural, and living you know, on both sides of the, the frontera. And, and, and that I think uh, later did me well, because it made me really appreciate the value of our community and the strengths of our community, the richness of our culture. Uh, all of that was very important. And, and for sure you have, uh, you have Throughout your career, you know, for, for, for decades, you have shown your, your love for your culture, um, for your people. And uh, I wonder what inspired you to, to be an activist, to, 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 to give back so much that you have given. And, and also, what inspired you to be, you know, to work so hard to be as successful as you have been as a, as a television and film director. There has to be something in your life, your family. You know, I'm sure our, our young audience and, and people that are listening and they will view this video will wanna know what, what is it that makes a person so successful? Share with us, I mean, what we wanna learn from you. Well, you know, um, I must confess that growing up, um, I was a victim, uh, as many of my generation, of being told that we as Mexicanos were inferior. And um, I grew up with a sense of inferiority about myself as a Mexicano. Um, I desperately wanted to be white. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until 
the Chicano movement came by in 1968, um, when that walkouts began to happen, that all of a sudden I realized uh, the, the kind of discrimination that we had been living under for years. And um, all of a sudden I realized that uh, there was value in who I was. And I saw a whole younger generation, my contemporaries at the time, uh, taking to the streets and demanding justice and demanding better education. And uh, this was a pivotal point in my life because it really turned me around. And I realized that what they were arguing for was what I wanted, which was a better life, not just for myself, but for my community. And that I was, and that we were not an inferior people, but that we had a lot of value to us, that we had a rich culture. And all of a sudden I, I decided that, that I really needed to get involved in this civil rights movement and become an activist. And I think um, a couple of months after the walkouts, I had the opportunity to, met, to meet Cesar Chavez. And um, I, I, I went up to Delano with a food drive that I had organized. And um, we, we had boxes of canned foods for the farm workers. And uh, we met with Cesar. And I was so impressed by this humble man, um, dressed very modestly, who was speaking about human dignity, about the dignity of the farm worker, about the injustices that were being leveled on us and about the, the importance of fighting for our own well-being and for justice. And I came back from that meeting with Chavez determined to devote my life to the things that I felt would better our community. And at the time, uh, I had picked up already a Super 8 camera, and I decided that I was going to use that camera and media uh, as much as I could to advance our community and its concerns. Wow. Well, that's that's a very powerful reason to 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 be motivated, right? What a what an amazing opportunity. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you were in the thick of things, my friend. We know that you were right in the middle with your with your Super 8 camera filming some of those momentous uh historical events where you know where uh people were were attacked and 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 um uh what do you remember i mean now let's go specific into those moments into those moments in history which are so important and we we cannot forget and that's one of the important things about this mexican-american history maker event that we that we many of us don't know the things that that that, uh, that our community had had to live with, like, like the slides that I showed earlier. Not many people remember that in the 50s and 60s, as, as early or as late as 50s and 60s, there were signs on the street saying no Mexicans or Blacks or dogs. And, uh, and so, so we, we need to remember this and we need for you to remind us uh, well, you know, about this, this moment, this, this time in history that, that you recorded with your camera. Well, I was very fortunate because I happened to uh, to be uh, at uh, KCET um, in 1970, 71, and um, I was able to be a part and to 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 go to where the action was, so to speak. And I got a chance to meet with the then um, activist leaders, not just Cesar Chavez, but Dolores Huerta. Uh, Reyes Lopez Tijerina, who led the land grant struggle in New Mexico, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez with his crusade for justice in Denver, Colorado, and Jose Angel Gutierrez, who created a political party made up of Mexican Americans in Texas, the Raza Unida Party, the United People Party. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in meeting with these people that I was able to uh, not just get a really profound understanding of the struggles of our community across the Southwest, but also I, I think I, I walked away from meeting these people with uh, the knowledge, the inspiration that um, they were passionate people 
and they were passionate about justice. They were, they were passionate about changing America for our community, whether it was as Jose Angel Gutierrez was doing with political uh, in, enfranchisement and the right to vote and getting our people political power, or whether it was the Crusade for Justice, Corky Gonzalez, uh, creating an organization that was self-help, that was economic in nature, trying to create an econ economic base for our community, or whether it was Cesar Chavez with, with the farm workers movement, or whether it was Reyes Lopez Tijerina with the land grant movement. All of these people shared one thing in common. They had passion. They had passion for justice. And I think that's something that has stayed with me all these years. Wow. Very, 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 very powerful. And um, we're going to get back to that in a little bit. But I want to go, I want to regress a little bit, my friend, and, and, uh, and talk about education. Because we know that the that one thing that allows you to achieve uh, uh, your, 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 your level of success as a director was your education. And I know that, uh, and then based on reading your book, I know that, um, that a, lot, a lot of things have to do with your time in Occidental College, or maybe, maybe not, not a lot of things, but there was a turning point at that moment that, that you know, that I want to know, I want to hear about that, because this is going to help our young audience who may be thinking, should I go to school? And if I go to school, what? And what's your story there, my friend? Well, you know, I, I, I went to Occidental College on a scholarship. It was one of the very early scholarships that was given to Mexican Americans. Um, uh, I, I think they recognized in me something, some value. Um, and I must say that my experience at Occidental started off very rocky. Uh, I really had culture shock because I was in a school, uh, I think uh, in the, my freshman uh, year, uh, well, at the time, I think at, in all of Occidental College, there was something like 2000 students. It's a small liberal arts college. And of that, there were only 10 of us that were uh, Mexican American. So that's, that's how, <laughs> how rare we were. And, um, and it was a culture shock for me to see uh, these uh, predominantly Caucasian uh, young people, my classmates, who came from uh, many of them from privileged backgrounds, uh, might, had much more money than my family did. Um, and, and so um, I, I felt like a fish out of water. I, I didn't know what I was doing there. But I stuck with it. And that was important because I did get a, a four-year education. And um, at the end of my education was when the Chicano movement happened. And so I had been infusing in myself um, this knowledge and this thirst for knowledge and for education. And when the Chicano movement came, I now had some place to direct that energy and, and that's that knowledge and, and, and those goals. And, and that's what I did. I, I became in, intensely involved in the Chicano civil rights movement. Um, I, I gravitated toward uh, uh, you know, filmmaking. And within the next few years, uh, I was hired KCT, the public broadcast station in Los Angeles. And I became a producer there. And, and from there, I did many, many documentaries and television shows. I had my own television show, Acción Chicano. Um, and then I went forward and, um, uh, and then I, I got involved in, um, in documentary filmmaking as well. Uh, this is me during uh, the, the production of Yo Soy Chicano. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I became actively involved and all of this again, motivated uh, by my desire to put media to work on behalf of our community. Because at the time, there, were, there was virtually no presence of Latinos, uh, contemporary Latinos uh, on television or in the movies. Now, we had, of course, the legends that had gone before the previous generation, the Ricardo Montalbans, the Anthony Quinns, the Cesar Romeros. But in terms of my generation, 
uh, the baby boom generation, uh, there was virtually none of us involved in, in motion pictures or television. Mm -hmm. And it was up to our generation and people not just like myself, but people like Moctezuma Esparza and, and Silvia Morales and uh, Jose Luis Ruiz and certainly Luis Valdez and others that became involved in the, in, in the media. And it was up to our generation to begin to change things. And I think over a period of time, uh, we, we have made some changes and we have made some progress. For sure, for sure. You, you have contributed in, in, in endless ways. Uh, you know, there is an, uh, uh, something that I, sometimes this stresses me a little bit and, and that, that is that because of, it's something that sometimes we don't realize, but there is certain certain genetic damage that happens when we keep being told that we are not good, when we keep being told that we come from a place that is not worth it, when we are uh, uh, and 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 we get we we become negative about ourselves, and when we see somebody to, to tr trying to be more successful and trying to get into the to a different environment, sometimes. Uh, we have uh, our, our people, our own people, ourselves. We have people that say, well, this person wants to, they don't want to be Mexican anymore, Mexican-American or Latino. Uh, did you have that experience as a student? And, and, and I bring this up because I'm sure that some of our young uh, uh, viewers will, may have this experience and knowing how you overcome this or how you feel about it may, may, have a may, may make a difference in their life. Well, certainly as I was growing up, the, the role models for me uh, as, as a Mexicano were the gardener, the, 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 the people working in the back of the kitchen. Uh, you know, there were very few positive role models at the time. Um, and, and um, you know, uh, I, I didn't have a whole um, array of, doctors and scientists and, and educators to, to look after, to, to say, oh, I wanna be like them. Um, and so I did develop a, an impurity uh, complex there for a while, but I think it was, uh, I think the liberating thing about the Chicano movement was it said to me, you know, you can be anything you want. And, and it, it took the notion that, that I was somehow limited, that somehow there was, uh, barriers for me, um, I, I, I refused to accept that anymore. And, and, and that was partially also because I saw what leaders like Cesar Chavez or Dolores Huerta or, or some of the other people were doing. And, and they weren't taking no for an answer. They were actively doing things. And I could see that the area that I had to move into was the media and to say, uh, you know, we can take over the media. And, and we, must, we must be forthright and, and try to figure out how to gain, first of all, the mastery of, of the, the technology, which we did, and then begin to, to break some of those barriers. And, and my generation of filmmakers first started with documentaries, and then uh, during the 70s, and then beginning into the 80s, we started doing uh, feature films, long form films, and television, and, and we moved on. And yep. certainly there is much, much area to, to grow yet, but uh, we did make an impact. And I think um, we, we, uh, we have a much more to do, but I think we now have also established organizations that, that also champion uh, Latinos in the media. Um, your organization, of course, is one of them, the, the Mexican American Education Foundation, uh, but um, we also um, have the Directors Guild of America Latino Committee, the Writers Guild Latino Committee, the SAG, uh, the Screen Actors Guild Committee. I mean, there, there are, there's our, our presence is in Hollywood now. Mm -hmm. and, and we are now beginning to see uh, more and more people uh, having breakthroughs in mainstream media. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, we owe all of that to, to, to people like you and Moctezuma and so many others that have really broken that, that barrier, right? Um, now, um, we wanna also for our, for our audience, we want to ask you, I mean, film industry is a very difficult uh, uh, industry to break into. And you did, 
uh, now speaking a little selfishly, wanting to know what your secret is, what the secret sauce <laughs> it is that the, the made they allow you to. And if somebody's thinking out there, oh my goodness, I want to be a director, what are the things? How do you achieve this success? How do you break through? Give us, a, I, 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 I'm sure that you could have a a two-hour conversation or maybe a full-day conversation on this, but just give us a few nuggets of, of, of information so, so, we, so, we, so, so we can all get excited and, and think that we want to be directors. Well, I must say you cannot do it alone. And I was fortunate because throughout my career, I have had mentors. I have had people that have been there um, for me and who believed in me. Um, and certainly, you know, you have to start with yourself. You have to have faith in yourself. You have to have faith in your ability to do things. You have to have faith that uh, you can break those barriers. And you have to have a passion. You have to have a passion that keeps going even when you get knocked down. And that passion is what gets you up again and makes you go again into the struggle. But again, you cannot do it alone. And, and I was fortunate because I had a few key people along the way that um, opened doors for me or were supportive of me and allowed my uh, creativity to flourish, uh, for, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, one of them was uh, um, uh, Charles Allen at KCET, um, who, um, who gave me a number of opportunities and who, when I said, I wanna do a film about Chicanos, and, um, and we're gonna call it Yo Soy Chicano, um, he was supportive and he helped me get the financing for it so that we could go forward. And then during the whole production, um, he, he didn't, no, no se metió. He, he let me just do my thing. And then he was very supportive. Once it was finished, um, the, um, there was a group um, that wanted to block its broadcast. The, uh, it was oh. called uh, Accuracy in Media. It was a, a, a right-wing organization that uh, didn't like the fact that I had featured Cesar Chavez uh, and the farm worker struggle, or actually Dolores Huerta and the farm worker struggle in the film. And they wanted to block its broadcast or they wanted equal time. And they wanted to put the growers on there. And, and uh, this gentleman at KCET, Charles Allen, uh, got the attorneys together and said, no way. This show is going to air broadcast nationally on PBS, the first PBS national broadcast film by a Chicano. Uh, and we're not going to we're not going to censor it. And so, again, uh, it was people that were at my side and, and, and backing me up that uh, that helped a lot. But um, I think the, the, the lesson to learn is that when you get knocked down, you have to get back up and and keep at it yeah. because yeah. Um, in, in this industry hollywood uh, media is um is is very difficult and, and harsh on people and then you're you're likely to be defeated many times you're going to be knocked down uh, and disappointed but uh, if you let that stop you um then you know then you're giving up and and i think uh, the one thing i've learned is you don't give up you just keep going and, and uh, eventually uh, opportunities uh, will come by and you need to be there ready to take advantage of them. So, so my friends, you know, learn from somebody who has achieved that success, you know. Um, first, the passion, right? And, 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 and if I understand clearly, it sounds like one of the things that gave you the passion and the motivation was your desire to help the, the, the community, the Chicano movement, um, you know, that, that, that powerful desire to help others and, and certainly the importance of, of reaching out and having mentors. And I, I, uh, I know that now you're involved in, in trying to mentor young, young filmmakers as part of the mentorship program of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation. And, and we're very thankful for that. I know that you're, you know, sharing that that program and uh and we thank you for that because we know how important it is to to give role models and and, and mentors to these young filmmakers they're gonna change our story they're gonna change the narrative um well we know that you've had 
dozens and dozens of awards by, by many of the film industry organizations. And I wanted to ask you, uh, do you, uh, do you have any specific one or one of those events that, that, that you can recall that, that, that you want to tell us about? Well, I've been fortunate in that my work has been recognized um, in the kind of uh, external way that, uh, that certainly you need to have be a success in Hollywood. You need to get the awards and stuff. But, you know, I, I think um, awards are like IQ tests. It's, it's, uh, it's what people... Um, it's what people measure, um, and and um, and and so um, uh, they they may or may not have any reference to reality, but they're important anyway. Uh, you know, I, I would say that um, uh, one of the films that I think was very important to me that um, that I, one of the awards that I won was uh, the Directors Guild Award for a program that I did called Gangs. And, and what I like about it was that that program also won. The New York Latino Film Festival Award for Best Film, and um, that uh, award. Uh, what I liked about the award was that it was recognized on two fronts. The Directors Guild recognized it for its technical, professional, directorial quality, and my own community recognized it. The the New York Latino Film Festival recognized it for the content because I had treated of our community in a sensitive way and, and had made our film, uh, the, uh, our community, um, you know, de dealt with our community in a very thoughtful and important way that was not stereotyped. And so I felt good about that, that award because it really meant that I was um, doing good work, not just technically, but also the content, the theme. And what was so important for me that I was being rewarded by my own community, that my own community could see the value in my work and, and was lauding it. And, and I think this has been one of the factors that always uh, that I always consider. And one of the reasons why I continue even to this day after I've retired from TV directing, I have my website Latinopia and I continue to do videos for that for our community. And, mm -hmm. and it's their approval that I look for, their, um, uh, the contributions that I make, I, I make for, I hope, uh, to advancing our community. Yeah, that's so, so special. Uh, we know that you directed, um, you know, some of the most recognizable TV shows in, 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 in our generation, you know, uh, endless, including Law and & Order and NYPD Blue and, and, and Resurrection Boulevard. Uh, do you remember any special, uh, um, you know, part of or any sp specific event during any of this uh, amazing work that you've done that, that you want to share with us? Well, you know, um, I, I think that um, I, I liked, um, the, the, I've done so many, I've done over 100 different kinds of shows. Um, but the, the ones that stand out in my mind are um, Star Trek Voyager, Babylon 5, um, and Resurrection Boulevard. And the one thing that they all have in common is that there were, in each show, there was a great family of people. And we all worked together as a family. Uh, there was so much respect and love from one to another and, and we, um, we, we worked hard to, to do the shows that we were doing, but um, the important thing was that we were working together, uh, creating something that was bigger than ourselves. And that was a particular show in question. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, for us as Latinos, uh, Resurrection Boulevard certainly is, is uh, for me, an, an, just an incredible memory of, of work because one, it was the first uh, English language drama on American television um, series. Uh, it was uh, written and executive produced by Dennis Leone and, and he hired me to shoot the, uh, the pilot. I directed the pilot and then the pilot was accepted and I became the supervising um, director and, um, and directed many of the episodes. 
And what was wonderful about that was, again, the sense of family, not just the cast, but the guest stars that would come on and the production crew itself. Um, the story I tell was uh, once we had finished the, uh, the pilot, um, uh, Showtime was paramount, was very interested in, in, in doing a series. And uh, we had a meeting and um, we were going to start selecting people to work as the editor and as the cameraman and as uh, you know the different departments. And, um, and I had come prepared with a stack of, of um, resumes of Latinos because it was a Latino show. So I figured, you know, we're gonna get, finally, this is our chance to get, to get our opportunity. And of course, um, they listened to me and then they said, well, you know, this is the first time out for, for you guys. And uh, we think that we should hire the very best talent there is, irrespective of whether they're Latino or not. And so that was telling me, oh, you don't think we have very talented people. And they said, well, you know, um, we, we think that uh, we should just get the best in each field. And then I said, and I looked over to Dennis Leone, who was my executive producer, and he and I had nurtured this project together. I said, well, you know, I'm sure you can find a, a writer that is more credentialed than Dennis Leone. And I'm sure you can find a director that's more credentialed than me. So why don't you just not hire us and go hire someone else. <laughs> and then you can do the first national show of Latinos on, P on, on, public, on um, American television. And there won't be any Latinos behind the screen. The, the screen. And that shut them up. Wow. They, they said, That's okay, you, you were let's brave, look at the resumes. <laughs> you were very pr pr brave and we're proud of you for that because you, know, you were, you were promoting and, and helping other people, all of our people get, get opportunities. And I agree. I mean, what an important thing to do. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering what, uh, what advice would you give our, our young, uh, I mean, people in this generation, uh, you know, they are Latino, Mexican American, and they, they, they maybe we can see that they're more and more involved in their culture. And, and that's such a good thing to see. We see a lot more of that happening today. Um, do you have any advice as an activist that you have been uh, all your life? Do you have any advice for our young community in regards to activism, in regards to pride in their culture, uh, specifically to that, my friend? Well, I think you, you, have, to, you have to believe in yourself and in your ability to do things. And you can't t let people tell you that you can't do something. And then comes a struggle to identify what it is you wanna do. So you have to have some goals, short-term goals and long-term goals. And then you have to go after them with a passion, with tenacity. You can't give up. You have to be there every day. You have to get up and say, today, this is what I am doing. This is, this is how, how I'm going to win today. And you have to do that every day. And once the nice thing is that once you get into the rhythm of it, it becomes like second nature. You begin to make decisions based on how you can advance the things you believe in. And when it comes to education, I think that's very crucial because the more education you have, the, more, the, the, the better armed you are to go into any kind of battle, to, to go into any kind of struggle. And so you need to equip yourself well. You don't wanna go into a battle unarmed and education is, is most important because of that. You have to get a good education. So college is essential. And then post-college, uh, uh, graduate school if possible. And then identify the, the field you wanna go into. And, and certainly avail yourself of the new technology uh, so that you, you, know, you, you don't need to have permission to pursue a career. You don't need to wait until you graduate to become a filmmaker. You can be a filmmaker without uh, anything. You can just be a filmmaker, do it. You can go to the internet. You can use your, your phone 
and and make movies, you know, as a filmmaker. But it, maybe you don't want to be a filmmaker. You maybe you want to be a writer, or or a, a director, or maybe you want to go into education, or into science. So you need to determine what it is you want to do and go after it with a passion. Wonderful. Well, you know. Um... I think a lot of uh, uh, the viewers uh, will now have the opportunity to, to have a role model if, if their direction, if their wish is to be in the filmmaking industry, because you are one of those role models. Now we can look up to people that have achieved success and, uh, and we're so happy. I see uh, many of our, you know, many of our uh, uh, people in our community like Jerry Velasco and Dan Guerrero who are you know, saying wonderful things about how 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 proud they are of you, my friend, uh, Jesus, and uh, we're so happy to see that. Thank you for those wonderful comments. Um, I want to ask you what um, what um, projects are you working right now that you're excited about? Could you share a little bit about your things that are making you exciting excited these days? Well, there's two. Uh, one of them, of course, is Latinopia. I started Latinopia 10 years ago, um, and um, every week I try to crank out a video. Uh, there's more than five, 600 videos on the site now, and they are videos about our community. They are um, art, literature, music, theater, cinema, food. And you can go there and you can find um, our artists. Uh, you can find our poets and our writers. Uh, um, reading or, or reciting their works. You can find, see our musicians performing. You can see a number of, of like I said, there's well, more than 500 videos on there that you can explore. And then there's a lot of written material as well, documents of, of our history and, and interviews with people. And so that's been a very exciting thing. And, I, and, um, and I'm, I, again, it's, it's my way of giving back to our community. And, um, and I welcome people to, to visit it. It's uh, www.latinopia.com. Uh, the other thing is on a personal level is uh, I'm two years into uh, a novel. And so I've, I've decided to, uh, I've always wanted to write a novel. And so I am working on it now and I hope to finish it this coming year. Wow, how excited. Do you want to share anything about it? Um, it's- um, Not yet? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to uh, give away. Too don't much jinx pieces. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sounds good. It sounds fair. Um, well, my friend, last question. Uh, you know, if you had a chance to talk to ten-year-old Jesus, and you were going to give him one piece of advice, the final piece of advice, what would it be? <laughs> I guess I, I guess I would say to myself, do, do the same thing that you did, only do it smarter. And how is that? Well, I, I, I would take someone else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> do it well, smarter. Sure. <laughs> My friend, what an amazing life. What an amazing experience. We are so... So we had so much fun uh, learning about your life and about all the contributions. And, and, and we are very thankful to La Plaza uh, that they give us the opportunity to, to, uh, to share their stories and we will continue to do so. Next, uh, in February, we have uh, um, Senator Durazo, uh, Maria Elena Durazo, who is going to be our next Mexican American history maker. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and Abelardo, please uh, um, take over, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ruiz. Thank you very much, Jesus. I mean, very inspiring words, great story that you tell. And, and your book is for sale somewhere, right? Yes, it's, uh, it's available through Arte Publico Press. Uh, let's see if I can show it here. Uh, there you are. Uh, it's uh, it's hard it. to see. Yeah, really. Can you see it? <laughs> anyway, it, it's available. There it is. It's our Art to Publico Press. It's um, uh, Eyewitness, a filmmaker's memoir of the Chicano movement. 
All right. Well, thank you. And of course, your your website, Latinopia. Uh, we posted it there on our on uh, the chat feature here on on Zoom on Facebook. For some reason, it does not allow me, but it's L A T I N O P I A dot com. Right. It's the utopia for Latinos. Latinopia. Incredible. All right. Well, we have a question here. Uh, you know, a lot of comments, a lot of shout outs. We have Jerry Velasco saying Jesus Trevino is the man. Many people owe a lot to Jesus Trevino, including myself. He helped many of us to further our careers. Please support Latinos, La Plaza, and the Mexican American Cultural Educational Foundation. Si se puede, says Jerry Velasco. And of course, we have Dan Guerrero. Jesus is a good friend and one of my personal heroes. His contribution to our hint is beyond measure. He would shun the spotlight and the attention, but he is truly one of our unsung heroes. Sing out Jesus. So, so this was your opportunity and we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, the question from Elias Serna. Uh, first of all, a little comment. Great lesson on getting up after letdowns, being ready and standing up for Rasa art artists. Last week, the California Board of education caved in to San Diego conservatives who accused ethnic studies teachers of using in La Quiche, you are my other poem in class, saying it's demonic Aztec prayer, which is a lie. Even schools keep demonizing us on our heritage. Any thoughts? How can artists respond to this type of insult and misleading information? You know, in La Quiche is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's all it is, but because it, it has an origin that isn't the pilgrims, uh, all of a sudden it becomes uh, questionable and it becomes demonic. Uh, it's the most positive thing I've heard. Uh, but yes, in La Quiche has, has a really beautiful sentiment. It says that, you know, you are my other self. If I do harm to you, I'm doing harm to myself. If, if I do well by you, if I do good to you, I'm doing good to myself. It's just the golden rule. And, um, and it's wonderful that it's coming from our culture, from our Mayan culture that goes back thousands of years. So, um, you know, we still have a lot to teach America, evidently. We, we, we sure do. And this is an opportunity. And of course, uh, Dr. Ruiz's group, the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation is that that's its goal to educate and to uplift and to provide opportunities and thank you for for being part of that effort particularly with uh your your mentoring of, of filmmakers and if you go to uh uh mexican uh american cultural foundation's website you'll see information about what they're doing and so you could keep up and and get involved uh yourself viewers so uh thank you for that uh just a couple shout outs here we have nancy de los santos where she's uh thank you he's a hero to all latino filmmakers jesus is a trailblazer rosea rosa maria marquez congratulations jesus continue your great work and gift to the community with latinopia and the hundreds of stories and performances you've documented there's more to do what do you think is there more to do jesus there there's always more to do but you know what what's great is we have the Nancy de los Santos, the, the Rosa Maria Marquez's, the, the Dennis Leone's, the, the, all the wonderful, uh, the Jerry Velasco's, all the wonderful actors and directors and writers and producers in our community now who are going forth to do it. And not just my generation, but the exciting new generation of people who are doing things. Most definitely. And we have Yolanda Perez of Alma del Sol Productions, former member of the Teatro Campesino, and was the musician on the special that Jesus Trevino produced featuring Daniel Valdez. Hi, Oli. <laughs> All right. So you have yes. some old, old friends tuning in here. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us, Jesus. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz, for, for your insightful questions that really brought up a lot of information and insights from, uh, from Jesus. So, uh, so thank you, viewers, for tuning in. Uh, if you came in late to the today's broadcast, or if you want to watch it, we recorded it. We'll be posting it on our Facebook page at La Plaza LA, uh, Facebook at La Plaza LA, and on our website lapca.org. And of course, it lives on Facebook and on YouTube at La Plaza LA. 
uh, we'll also share it with uh, with uh, with the Mexican American and Cultural Education Foundation. They'll be posting it on their website as well. Exactly. And um, you could see all of uh, Masef's uh, uh, Mexican American history makers on our YouTube channel. So check them all out. Uh, let's see. We'll talk a little bit about what's coming up on La Plaza de Cultura y Artes en Casa con La Plaza. We have tomorrow uh, Lalo Alcaraz, award-winning cartoonist and principal artist for covidlatino.org talking about how he's fighting COVID with his cartoons. And that's Wednesday, January 19th at 7 p.m. And then on Friday, January 21st, Edule, an artist, musician, and songwriter and poet, she'll be talking about how she reflects and views the world through songs. She'll be in conversation and performance, so she'll be singing some songs for us. Oh, uh, we have some new messages coming in from uh, from our friends here on Zoom, uh, the Golden Rule says Elia Serna, Rosie Chavez, ese es mi hermano. Estoy orgullosa de ser su hermana. And Magdalena Isnaga saying great interview, and I'll have to agree with that. All right. Well, with that, thanks to our sponsors uh, again, uh, CVS Health, Aetna, Union Pacific Foundation, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, California Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. And of course, my colleagues at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. Uh, check us out on our YouTube page, on our Facebook page, and come back soon. Jesus, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Dr. Ruiz, we'll see you next month. Until next time. All Have right, a bye great bye. night. Thank bye you. Bye. All right, buenas noches a todos. Buenas noches.